Okay, welcome everyone to another social emotional workshop. Today we are going to be dealing with the subject of how many times have I told you? <laughs> so welcome back, Joe, and we're so glad to have you. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I bet every parent in the entire world has uttered that phrase, how many times must I tell you? And I don't know, is there a clear answer to that question? We're gonna talk about that. How come we have to tell them multiple times? Uh, how do we gain cooperation? So let's get right into it here. So before I get into all the skills and stuff, I'm gonna talk about why don't they listen? And out of all the parenting programs that I've read, all the books, all the trainings that I've had, I come up with a handful of things about communication and reasons why kids won't communicate. And the first one is setup questions. And a setup question is a question you ask your children that they can't answer correctly. So a setup question is, did you clean your room? And I'll ask Tony, did you clean your room? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, you call that clean? That ain't clean. You get in there and clean it. <laughs> As you were saying that, I was saying in my head, now clean is subjective. <laughs> yes, it is. So we, we raise I don't know children. And if anybody in the audience here has an I don't know child, every time you ask them something, I don't know. What are you doing? I don't know. How do you feel? I don't know. Did you do this? I don't know because we set them up all the time. So we ask them a question that they can't answer correctly. So, uh, Tony, did you clean your room? Say no this time. No, I did not. No, how many times must I tell you? Why don't you clean your room? You get in there and you clean. So whether she says yes or she says no, there's no right answer because I'm gonna criticize either way. Now, also we ask our kids, how do you feel? So if I ask somebody here, I'm going to ask if Kayla is online and you can give me a random feeling word, Kayla. Or anybody, give me a random feeling word. So how do you feel? Frustrated. Frustrated? What are you so frustrated for? Why don't you just slow down and figure stuff up? Break it down into steps. I don't know why everybody's so frustrated. Give me another uh, feeling where it's somebody. Tired, I feel tired. Oh my gosh, tired. You know that you stay up all night, no wonder you're tired. Why don't you get some sleep once in a while? So we ask our kids these setup questions. And then when they answer us, we tell them that they're wrong. So our kids kind of get to the, I don't know. Same thing with how many times must I tell you? If the child says once, what does the parent respond? Once, I told you a hundred times, don't give me that once. And if the child said 13, the parent will say, don't be a smart aleck with me. So those answers or those questions can't be answered correctly. So the kids finally say, I don't know. How many times must I tell you? I don't know. How do you feel? I don't know. I'd rather say, I don't know and be safe rather than answer that question and have you criticize me to give me a long lecture on why I shouldn't be the way I am. Uh, the next one, why kids might not share or why they won't listen is, are they objects or are they assets? Which means you treat them as objects, like the helicopter parent. So we're saying, all right, get up. All right, go over there, put that away. Hang your backpack up. Right, it's time for dinner. Set the table. Come in, go out. So are we treating them as objects or are we treating them as assets, being a valuable contributing member of the family? Because if I'm an object, you say do that, I'm going to go do it. Then I'm going to sit down and wait for my next command. Then I'm going to say, why don't you do anything around here? Well, you didn't tell me to. What do you want me to do? So when kids perceive themselves as objects, they're going to do what you say and then wait for the next command. They won't have the initiative 
to do um, the things that they should be doing or that they could be doing to con be contributing to that family. Another one would be kids won't listen to you until they feel listened to. So I was a spanker in the beginning, and then I learned that spanking was bad or ineffective, I should say. Nothing's really good or bad. So I started lecturing, and then I found out that lecturing is probably just as bad as spanking, if not worse. So if you're a long-winded lesson teacher, as in uh, long lectures and telling them what they should be thinking, it's kind of connected to the setup question. So they just don't feel like they're heard. So unless they're heard, they're not going to listen to you. And we'll get into some tips on how to get that conversation going. Another one. The best way to get someone to lie to you is to never trust them. Hmm, interesting one. What does that mean to somebody? The best way to get someone to lie to you is to never trust them. Interesting phrase. So this is also kind of set up to the setup question. If you expect me to lie to you, if you don't trust me, I'm going to be more so able to lie to you because I don't want to get in trouble. So let me give you an example here. If the school calls and says that your child skipped school today, he wasn't in school. So your child comes home and you tell, ask him, so how was school today? Really? Okay, son, what'd you have for lunch? Yeah, who'd you sit next to? Yeah, and then you say, liar. So you expected him or her to lie. You set them up. Just like if you saw them take $10 out of your purse or your wallet. And then you ask them, did you take $10 out of my wallet? And what are they going to say? No. And then you're going to say, what do you mean? No, I saw you do it. So why did you ask them? If you know the information, then bring out that objective information. I heard you weren't in school today. What's going on? I saw that you took $10 out of my wallet. What's going on? Instead of setting them up. So if I build this barrier towards you and set you up to lie, and then you lie and I catch you in that lie, I am going to kind of stop sharing with you. I'm going to kind of sit back and kind of protect myself any way I can. Uh, the last one here, if the student doesn't know, the teacher hasn't taught. Uh, so many times, you know, these kids get bigger and they get taller and things, and we're thinking like they're little adults, they should know. I had a lot of high expectations for my son. And I just expected him to know because, you know, I know, I learned it, how come he hasn't learned it? So if your child or your student is doing something over and over, and you're wondering why, well, if the teacher hasn't taught, that student doesn't know. And that can be kind of in discipline too. So if we just punish them and don't teach them a alternative solution or a, how did Teresa put it when she did the no tricks to discipline? That discipline is teaching them a new code of conduct. Instead of doing this, which is um, not healthy or dangerous, we need to do this instead. Until we teach our children what to do instead, then they're just not going to know and they're going to keep on making that same mistake over. So I really like this phrase here. Don't worry that they're not listening to you. Worry that they're watching you. They're going to learn more from your behavior, from your responses, from your modeling, than from your words in lectures.
Okay, so unconditional love. And I have those question marks after unconditional love. And I think I went through this in previous trainings, but for the most part, we unconditionally love our children. I'd imagine everybody would agree. Although our responses might not feel like that. They, their perception is we don't, that our love is conditional. So if they make a mistake, or if we set them up to lie, or if we lecture them, or if we punish them after a mistake, they're feeling that they're not loved. So they feel like I'm only good if I do my homework. I'm only good if I do my chores. I'm only good if I um, um, do what I'm told. Because if I don't, then I'm not liked, I'm not respected. So the children's perception of if they're loved is what counts, not your heart. And this comes from love and logic. When children feel loved on conditions of their achievements, they distance themselves. They move away from their parents to save themselves the pain of feeling they're disappointing them. That really opened my eyes because my son wouldn't get close to me. He was always kind of distant because I was a lecturer. I used to be a spanker. I was a setup question guy and I never had that closest to my son. He was a I don't know child. And after I read this, I'm like, wow, he doesn't get close to me because he doesn't want to disappoint me. And that really opened my mind to a whole new philosophy of, of uh, that child's behavior. I'm like, wow, because our kids want to please us. Our kids want our approval. Our kids want us to be proud of them. And if they feel that they're not, they can't handle that disappointment. So they may pull themselves away to protect themselves, that pain, and that feeling that they're disappointing us. Wow, that was just, um, my mind just couldn't wrap around that until I was like, that's my son. Now this was out of my four goals of misbehavior. And I just wanna do a little quick review on a misbehaved child is a discouraged child that children behave their feelings. There's a reason why children behave. And if you remember those four reasons, they're gonna to behave to get attention, to get power, or maybe just to get revenge because they don't like what happened to them the day before, or how you treated them, or how you punished them, or they're gonna display inadequacies by saying, I can't do anything and the parent's gonna do everything for them. So we really need to get to the belief behind the behavior. Why are they behaving this way? And it's really important to understand that, that that misbehaved child is a discouraged child. Why are they doing that? So how do we usually handle misbehavior? Interesting question. Everybody has their own kind of uh, discipline uh, techniques and stuff. We usually handle misbehavior by what Willy Wonka did. He puts them on a scale and measures them good or bad. All right, and if they're good, we reward them. If they're bad, we kind of punish them. So I don't know who wasn't raised with rewards and punishments, because most of us raised with rewards and punishments as a child. You do good, you're accepted. Yes. Thank you, absolutely. You do bad, you're rejected. Now, of course, we don't reject them, but the child feels rejected because when they do good, they hear language of praise and acceptance. When they do bad, we catch them being bad, they hear language of punishment and rejection. So they're in a constant pendulum. I'm good, I'm bad. I'm good when I do this, I'm bad when I do that. In our adult brains, we're saying that if we make, if we punish them, they should learn not to do it again. 
Wouldn't that be a good philosophy? But how many times did you feel like doing better after you've been hurt? Either through physical hurt, through a spanking, or through emotional hurt, through that rejection, and how many times must I tell you, and you better listen to me, and, and that kind of uh, parenting um, um, a rant that we might do for a child that wasn't being good. So with rewards and punishments, it's really the parent's job to catch them when they're good and reward them and catch them when they're bad and punish them. It's the parent's responsibility because if the parent didn't catch them when they were good, was that child really good? Did that child say, well, didn't anybody see what I did? I feel ripped off because nobody said that I didn't get a reward for being good. Now look at the other side of that. If the child was bad and they didn't get caught, was it really bad? Because they didn't get a punishment. So they did bad, looked over their shoulder. Hmm. Nobody caught them. So was it really bad? So it's up to the parent to find that out. So rewards and punishments they're finding out is not the best way to uh, have the healthiest cooperation, the healthiest outcome of that child. Now, if rewards and punishments worked for you, that's great. But I would also ask, did it really work for you? What did you learn? What did you learn from that rewards and punishment situation? Now that you're an adult, how do you handle um, conflict? How do you solve so, uh, problems? Uh, do you want to make somebody feel bad? to make you feel better. So um, I was talking to my colleague the other day about back in the day, everybody's saying that that's what's wrong with this world, this permissive parenting, parenting that doesn't have a consequence for these children who aren't um, doing what they're supposed to do. So we need those spankings back. We need that control back. We need the rewards and punishments back. But then I would say, look back into history when we were growing up. I'm older than most of you, but I see on Facebook all the time, you know, that that child needs a whooping or um, the humiliation that you see on Facebook, like the, the dad following the kid to school while the kid's walking in the rain. The kid got kicked off the school bus. So now for a punishment, dad's making him walk to school in the rain why dad follows him and he's video recording him. See, that's my son, look at that. What a great father I am. Look at my son, he was bad on the bus and now he's gonna learn, all right? So he might learn never to misbehave on the bus again because he doesn't wanna walk in the rain. But what did he learn for the future? Now, in the future, when somebody is misbehaving if somebody is not living up to his expectations, how does he solve that problem? Does he use that humiliation? Does he use that pain? Because if somebody learns through pain, or if we teach through pain, and that child learns through pain, now what do they learn in the future? How are they going to teach? Through pain. In pain, I don't necessarily mean a spanking. It could be um, withdrawal of privileges and anything that wants to have that child suffer. Let me put it this way. And I talk about a timeout because timeout is uh, what they have in discipline techniques for younger children to put them in a timeout. A timeout could be either a punishment or it could be discipline. And you guys tell me which one this is. Here's a timeout. I'm sick of you two fighting. I'm, you're done. I said, I'm, somebody's going to get hurt. You get in your room and you stay there for 15 minutes. Think about what you've done. Now, would you think that's discipline or would you think that's a punishment? It's a punishment. It's a punishment. Okay. Now, here's another way of uh, the, the timeout sibling rivalry, you go out there and say, you know, I get really worried when you two fight because somebody can get hurt. Why don't you go in your room, come back out when you can play nice. Is that a punishment or discipline? 
That would be a more discipline because of the way you're speaking to the child. Okay. Yeah. And explaining what you, why you're doing it. Yes. Yeah, so that was more respectful and stuff. So it was, the first one was, I'm sick and tired of you two get in your room and stay for 15 minutes. So you want them to suffer. Think about what you've done. But now, the second way, when I said, I feel really worried when you two fight because somebody can get hurt, go to your room, come back out when you're feeling better. Now, let's say that kid went in his room for two seconds, came right back out after two seconds. What does the parent do? You haven't thought about that. Go back to your room. <laughs> okay. So some parents would say that wasn't long enough. You get back in there. And right when you want to do that, that's when it turns into punishment. Because what you're saying is, what do you tell them to do in the first place? Go in your room, uh, settle down, come back out when you can play nice. If that child went in his room for two seconds, came back out, was playing nice, you solved the problem. But if you're like, that was too short, you get back in there. Now you're saying you need to suffer some more to learn that you were wrong, to learn that that was wrong. So once you want them to suffer some more, that's when it turns into punishment. Joe? Yes. I've got a question. What happens when you ask your kids to do that, say, for example, because this happens all the time at my house with my two younger boys, and then um, one or both of them refuse to go to their room, or in my case, the two boys share a room, and... Um, if that's the best place to put them because of whatever else is going on in the house, then they just go in there and continue arguing. But more often than not, it's just that they won't do what I ask them to do. Like if I say, go calm down, they don't go. Yes. So now if we can hold that question just for a little bit, because now we're going to get sure. into some of the reasons why. So they're not doing that they're not going into their room and calming down or they're going into the room together, still con in conflict. And we're, we have to get to the belief behind that behavior. Why are they still angry? Why won't they um, take this discipline you know, effectively and appropriately? And you know, I'm respecting them. How come they are still disrespecting me? Okay. And, and we'll get into that because it's all about um, gaining cooperation and gaining respect. Okay. So, and before I move on, so how do you feel when this is going on? You remember that, um, that slide about the feeling words? Um, do you feel annoyed, angry, hurt, or overwhelmed? Um, or I should say hopeless. Annoyed, angry, hurt, or hopeless? Part, I would say partly um, maybe hopeless because it happens well and annoyed maybe because it happens so much with the two of them all right so now let me ask you the second follow-up question after the first feeling word so you feel hopeless but you're annoyed first but it keeps on happening so you feel hopeless so how do you respond when you give them that direction and then they don't you know assimilate to that direction i will give them the direction again but then i don't <laughs> then I will not sound as respectful okay, as, so, as I did the first time. <laughs> okay, so if you remember the, um, the four goals of behavior, so at first we're annoyed, then we get angry, and then we want to hurt them, and then we give <laughs> up, whatever. So there is that progression. Yeah. But your first emotional response is really why they are misbehaving that way. So if you're frustrated and you <laughs> re-give them the direction again, they're getting a lot of attention from that. Right, the siblings are getting attention from each other because I annoy my brother and he gets all frustrated and he, you know, attacks me back. I attack him back. So they're getting their needs met between each other. And then mom comes in and gives some lecturing and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they, in my eyes, their goal of misbehavior is uh, attention. Yeah. But, but they're getting their attention in a negative way. Yes. So they're kind of conditioned, hey, this is a way to get attention. I know my brother and he gives me a lot of attention and then mom comes and gives us attention. So now <laughs> we have a lot of attention going on in an unhealthy, negative way though. Okay. So <laughs> let's get into the communication here and hopefully that we can give you some tools on how to redirect that in a healthier way. Okay, thank you. 
So this, um, I like this phrase here, um, you can't punish a child into better behavior. Or could we? Because we're bigger, we're stronger, we're tougher, we have all the money, we have all the food, we have everything. So could we punish them into better behavior? Well, maybe you can, I really doubt it. But if you did, if you can, what did they learn? They learned that the hierarchy has the control. And if you want to, if you want to modify somebody's behavior, all you have to do is have control over them, control their, their, um, their food, control their money, control what they can do, control where they go. And then maybe you could get that assimilation from them. But then you go to the next one. If you use that control and that punishment and it worked, I always say, did they never behave that way again out of fear and pain of suffering or out of pure inner values? So if you gave a child a spanking for doing something bad and they never did it again, I always say, did that work? Yeah, they never did it again, but they never did it again out of fear not out of pure inner values. Now, the next bullet point here, if a child doesn't respect you, they won't respect your values until they're 40 years old or 30 or 40. Because now I can look back at the way I was parented, very aggressively, very whoopings everywhere, taking grounding, taking all my stuff away constantly. But now I can look back and I can say, wow, you know what? I know why dad did that. You know, dad made me a very strong person. I learned a lot of values and a lot of lessons from my father. But I, I would ask, do you think my dad could have taught me all those lessons and me still have a relationship with him? Because I didn't have a relationship with my father at all. But now that he's dead, he's been dead for 30 years. And now that I'm a mature adult, I can look back and say, wow, I learned a lot of lessons from him. But don't you think he could have taught me those same lessons and still had a relationship with him? Yes, but he didn't know how to teach me lessons to have that relationship with him and me take those pure inner values into my adult life. So we can kind of never look back to say, well, um, I respected what he did. Well, now you did, you do because of what it, the values it taught you. But back when you were eight years old, six years old, getting yelled at or screamed at or hit, you weren't respecting it at all. But now that our brains are, are hardwired, now we can rationalize and say, wow, I'm a strong person because of. All right, so that's all the discipline. Now let's get into um, you know, how to gain cooperation and such. Now, a lot of parents, they want obedient children. And I don't want to, I usually set people up to say, who wants obedient children? And then people raise their hand. And then I was like, really, are you sure? Because what does obedience mean to you? Obedience means do what I say, when I say, how I say, if I say, and everything's going to be all right. But if you don't, then there's going to be some pain involved because I have to modify your behavior to get you to assimilate to what I know is best for you. That's where you get the disconnect from children. When you want that object, remember that object from that first slide? When you give them setup questions, when you want them to do exactly what you said, if not, there's going to be a lecture or a lesson, then they get, they kind of separate, they kind of pull away from you. Now, with this obedience here, if they're obedient to you, who else would they be obedient to? If you taught them to be obedient and they do, they're sweet, wonderful children, they do exactly your values and everything around the house and their chores and everything. Who else would they be obedient to? Predators. Absolutely. Predators love obedient children. All I have to say is, hey, your mommy told you to come with me. Really? Oh yeah, she got hurt and she's over, she's over here. 
they see the obedient child because obedience kind of creates a little bit of um, self-submission or uh, low self-esteem or just a people pleaser. Obedience, if I do what you ask me to do, you're going to accept me. So in the schoolyard, if I do what people are telling me to do, then I'm going to be accepted. So obedience kind of creates people pleasers as well as um, the risk of being vulnerable to, you know, somebody higher on the hierarchy, predators and such. So obedience, and one thing why, ch this is what I say about parents who want obedient children. I think they want obedient children because they don't know what to do if they're not obedient. Ooh, that's a big phrase there. Parents want obedient children because they don't know what to do if they're not obedient. Because if my child goes against my rules, my values, what do I do? Because I'm so frustrated and what, I don't know how to get them to my values. I don't know how to get cooperation without that obedience. And I'm not saying all parents do this because some parents can raise obedient children. They turn out to be wonderful, uh, productive citizens of our society. That's great, it could work. Remember, it's, this isn't right or wrong stuff. This is effective and ineffective. So some of this stuff might work. You might raise an obedient children. He'll be a great uh, police officer, security guard, go in the service, follow orders like nothing. It's just, um, they could be wonderful people, even if they don't go in the service. But I think people want obedience, but what they really want is cooperation two or more people working together, mutual supportive manner for a common goal. So those three types of parents, dictator um, parents, remember that closed circle? Uh, I think, I don't know if Patricia or me talked about the three parenting styles. The dictators is just total limits. No freedom, they just stay in the circle. So dictators demand cooperation. You do what I say, you understand? Uh, doormats, those are, that's that squiggly line that there's no um, consequences. You just let them do whatever you want. Doormats hope for cooperation. They're like, can you please cooperate? Just can you please hang your backpack up when you, when you come home? <laughs> can you just please clean up? You know, everybody's just, just hoping and praying for cooperation. But active parents comes from this curriculum, teach cooperation. You know, we teach cooperation by mutual respect, participation, have them participating. They need to be a valuable contributing member of the family. They can't be an object or they're not going to um, cooperate. They're just going to be objects. Because if I was having company and I was like, hey, can you straighten out the living room while I cook dinner? That child might do things in the living room like you didn't even know. They might even straighten up the bookcase and do dust. But if you say, do this, 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 and that. That object is gonna do this, this, this. Probably skip that just to tick you off, right? Because they're not, I got some self-dignity. I gotta protect myself in some way. So they'll do exactly, pick up those socks, hang your backpack up, put your clothes away and move that over there. And that's all they'll do. But if they're valuable participants, they might swifter, they might straighten out the cushions, they might fold the blankets, they might, they might do a lot more, but they need to be a valuable participant. So in our parenting um, classes, we say, you have two choices. Do you want to give attention? Or do you want to help your child be self reliant? Do you want to show who's the boss? Or do you want to help your child be independent and responsible? Do you want to get even? Or do you want to show that you understand? And the last one, do you want to let your child off the hook so they'll never suffer any pain? Or do you want them to be self-confident? And I hope it's the, um, the first the, um, statement in each of these dichotomies here that if you want to give attention, then you're going to condition them to be annoying and just bid to each of their attention. If you want to show who's the boss, you're going to have power struggles all the time. 
if you want to get even, well, you might win, but tomorrow they're going to find something else to get even about. So the blue text, I hope we can make that, but some parents, they're stuck on being the boss, getting even, or more the permissive, never letting them suffer, giving attention every, every time they bid for it. So we have problems. Every family has problems. We think these wonderful families out there that you know, maybe your colleagues, your friends, your family, you know, they have problems too. But successful families handle their problems and they learn from them. They have respect, they have communication, they have problem solving. But unsuccessful uh, families uh, make their problems worse because they don't have the tools on how to learn from this problem so it doesn't happen again. So with problems, you can teach all those wonderful things here on the bottom of the slide. Teamwork, responsibility. So with the problem, we have to find out who owns the problem. Now, with that sibling rivalry, who owns the problem? If two kids are fighting together, is that a child-owned problem or is it a, um, a parent-owned problem? And the way to find that out is you ask these four questions. Whatever problem is in the household, sibling rivalry, wake-up struggles, going to bed struggles, homework, brushing your teeth, all of these problems that are going on. Are your rights being disrespected? Can anyone get hurt? Is anybody's property in danger? And is your child too young to handle this problem on his own? Now, if the answer to every question is no, that is a child-owned problem. We don't have to do much. We don't have to get involved. We don't have to solve it. We don't have to do anything. But if there's one yes in any of these four questions, that is a parent-owned problem. Now we need to solve that problem because either your rights are being disrespected, somebody might get hurt. There could be three yeses in a problem. There could be four yeses in a problem, but it only takes one yes out of these four questions to know that it's a parent-owned problem. Because we have to know who owns it because whoever owns the problem is responsible for solving it. If it's a child-owned problem, and we solve it for them, for one, they're not learning to solve their own problems. For two, we don't teach them any, um, anything about their cognitive process of having a problem and knowing they have autonomy over this problem, knowing they have a choice. Sibling rivalry, if we go in there and say, stop it, you get over there, you get over there, I'm sick and tired of you, blah, 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 and we take care of that problem, what did the children learn? that the parent will step in and deal with it. Exactly. They learn that they don't have to do anything about their behavior because mom or dad is gonna come and take care of it. Stop it, get over there, get over there. But it's a child owned problem. All we have to do is go in there, maybe say an iMessage and, and leave. And I'll get a little deeper into this in a second. So parent owned problems, we're gonna provide discipline and Teresa already did that lesson with, there's no tricks to discipline healthy discipline, when, then, either, or, discipline that teaches a new code of conduct. But I'm gonna focus on child-owned problems in this presentation. And when it's a child-owned problem, all we're going to do is provide support. Avoid communication blocks, which I'll show you what uh, that looks like in a second. And then let the ch uh, child handle that problem. Offer support, but don't take over. So with this communication, when we're going to deal with a problem, we have to worry about what message is coming out because our words, our tone, our nonverbal cues all have communication um, messages. So if I go in there and say the perfect eye message, but I'm all, my eyes and my lips are all angry, I get frustrated when you two fight because somebody can get hurt. Go in the room and settle down and that's like, whoa, I'm using a wonderful parenting skill of an iMessage, but my tone, my face, my body is saying, I disagree or I don't accept what you're doing right now and I'm really angry. And that child's gonna get a totally different message. 
our tones, everything we have to make sure matches. So children actually learn, they don't really learn. They could learn from rewards and punishments, but remember, what are they really learning for skills for the future? Children learn through empathy and consequences. The more empathy and understanding we show, and I love this quote right here, the more they are forced to think about the pain they have created for themselves. If it's a child-owned problem, you say, wow, man, that really stunk. Man, that was a tough spot you got yourself into. Wow, so what are you gonna do? You just empathize. The consequence is the teacher. So they're experiencing the consequence and we're just empathizing with it. And they're going to be forced to feel that pain that they chose to have through their behavior. But the more anger we show, the less they think. If we go in there with our disappointment and our ridicule or our lecture, they're going to go into their fight or flight, cortisol shoots in their brain, and they're not going to learn your wonderful lecturing lesson. They're just going to shut down. So they learn through empathy and consequences. So we really need to know how to communicate. So um, this is a funny little mock of um, a mother and daughter. The kid got in trouble passing notes in school. So let's watch what happens if we don't have the right communication skills. Uh oh. If we're going to win cooperation from our children by using our communication skills, then we must first learn to avoid saying and doing things that block communication. We all want to be askable parents, the kind of parents children come to when they are faced with a difficult problem. But too often, and without even meaning to, we respond to our children in ways that discourage them from asking. We call these obstacles communication blocks. For example, we have been known to issue commands to our children, judge them, placate them, interrogate them, distract, psychologize, or moralize to them. We may be sarcastic or act like a know-it-all. The result is that children learn over time to avoid talking to us about their problems. Let's take a tongue-in-cheek look at how Jordan's parents might use all of these blocks in one conversation. I don't believe it. You don't believe what? Miss Powell, I was sitting there minding my own business while Kristen and Cody were passing notes back and forth. Then Miss Powell turns around and sees me passing this note to Kristen. Only it wasn't from me, it was from Cody. But Miss Powell thought it was from me and gave me extra homework because I apparently have too much time on my hands. It isn't fair. Well, son, what you need to do is march right up to Miss Powell and tell her what really happened. No, I can't do that. The kids will call me a tattletale. Well, Jordan, you can't go through life worrying what others will think about you. You don't understand. I have to spend every day with these kids. Oh, honey, you're so smart and so much fun. I don't think they'd stop liking you. You don't understand. They hate tattletales at my school. I won't have any friends. Well, why were you passing notes in the first place? Why would you put yourself in the middle that way? I was just trying to do them a favor. I tell you what I think. I think you like Kristen, and we're using this situation to flirt with her. Mama, I don't even like girls. Not like that. Well, son, someday you will. Did I ever tell you about the first time me and your mama went out? Yeah, about a dozen times. Oh, don't be disrespectful to your father, young man. He was only trying to help. After all, we've lived longer, and we know more about these things. Okay, okay, whatever. Now that's the wrong attitude to take. How do you ever expect to improve yourself when you think like that? Oh, come on, that's not fair. Oh, and life's supposed to be so fair. <laughs> I am so glad he felt free to come to us with his little problem. Yeah, I don't know why he doesn't ask more often. <laughs> why doesn't he ask more often? 
why does any come to mom or dad? So any of these recognized by any parents in the group? I probably did uh, about 80% of these. So once we get into that communication block, which is any words or tone or body language that influences a person, uh, sharing a problem to end communication. So once we start with the sarcasm or the know-it-all or the lecture or the moralizing, interrogating, that child just puts his head down and why even try? So it's really discouraging when we use these communication blocks and we really got to do that self-assessment. When, when you are trying to teach your child something, when we're trying to gain cooperation from them, are we using any of these communication blocks, set up questions? We really have to take a look on how we are coming across. Are we treating them as objects instead of assets? So it's really discouraging and it just removes their, their courage to actually trust us. So this is a five-step uh, process of active listening. And I'm going to kind of uh, not give you so, too much detail on this because I'm gonna show a video that they're gonna explain it. But we need to do that, listen actively, identify his feelings, look for alternatives, offer encouragement, follow up later. And that'll be a little bit more clear in a minute. So really pay attention to your child. Even if they're not coming to you to communicate, if they're sitting there like, they're communicating something, something's going on, something happened at school or with their friends or something. So children speak in code. So we have to say, hmm, I wonder what's going on. What, is, what, what feeling do I see in my child? And then we're gonna have to uh, say, wow, it looks like you're really down about something that happened at school. And you give that little open-ended um, invite. When the child starts talking, Acknowledge what the child is saying. Say, hmm, wow, I see, man, hmm. And you're actively engaged in that conversation. A really cool thing I saw in a presentation was the lean. Like if there's a table or desk or bookcase or something and your child's talking, lean on it. That means, tell me more. You know, I got time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to you. And then actively look them in the eyes and stuff. And then show empathy. That's when they are expressing a feeling. Wow. Oh my, that must have been scary. Wow, that happened. And you're just engaged in that conversation. So people don't know how much you know until they know how much you care. So we really need to show empathy because if our children are expressing a feeling, and we're like, you shouldn't have that feeling because you should do this and you wouldn't deal with that feeling. And we're telling them not to have it. We're not doing them any good because we need to let them know that that feeling is okay. Now we can help them deal with that feeling in healthy ways, but first we need to identify with the feeling. When we empathize, it creates oxytocin, which is that love chemical, the bonding chemical. That's uh, why um, females like to um, be intimate after they're intimate. They like to hug because it's bonding and these chemicals bond us to each other. Mm. Same with our children. When the, we need to show empathy so they can trust us, so they can be close to us, so they know that they're safe. So these identifying and responding. So while they are talking, you have to say, what is my child feeling? What feeling word could capture him or her right now? And how can I respond to her feelings about what happened? And that's that reflective listening. I think Teresa talked about it in her lesson about there's no tricks to discipline. She talked about eye messages and reflective listening, which is, wow, it sounds like you felt really sad about what happened. And you must be really overwhelmed with uh, the new learning experience that you had online. You must feel really disappointed that you didn't get invited to the party. Just lay that feeling out there. So let's watch this. I think there's a video next here. 
and they're going to explain this active communication. You can see it with the Jordan and the note passing in school. It's playing, Joe. Say that again? Nothing's playing. You can't hear them? Did you hear the last one, the communication block one? We did hear that one, but this one, nothing's playing. Huh. About school and career. Can you hear that? And life and death yeah. choices about drugs, hmm. sex, criminal behavior, and other risks. Give Jordan her full attention, acknowledge what he is saying, and show empathy. That is, show that she not only understands, but actually feels what Jordan is feeling. Step two, identify and respond to feelings. By putting herself in her son's shoes, Nicole would try to tell what he is feeling. Then she'll acknowledge that feeling to him. This helps to establish trust and a spirit of cooperation between them. Once this connection is made, and not before, Nicole can go to the problem-solving step. That would be step three. Look for alternatives and evaluate consequences. Here, Nicole will ask Jordan what he might do about the problem. She'll guide him to come up with alternative solutions and help him to predict how each might work out. The parent's role here is not to fix the problem, but to provide support and guidance as the child works through it and finds a solution. Remember that in children, the part of the brain that weighs risks against consequences is not completely developed yet. This step helps them slow down and consider the consequences of their choices before they jump into action. Step four of the active communication process is to offer encouragement. Nicole would do this by building on Jordan's strengths and showing confidence in his abilities. And finally, for step five of the active communication process, Nicole will follow up later by remembering to ask Jordan how it went. Let's watch. I don't believe it. You don't believe what? Miss Powell, I was sitting there minding my own business while Kristen and Cody were passing notes back and forth. Then Miss Powell turns around and sees me passing this note to Kristen, only it wasn't from me, it was from Cody. But Miss Powell thought it was from me and gave me extra homework because I apparently have too much time on my hands. It isn't fair. You sure sound angry. What did you be? I mean, it wasn't even my note. And yet you're the one being punished. I could see why you'd be so upset. Yep, and Kristen and Cody just sat there and giggled. You must have been furious about that. They started and then let me take all the blame. And of course all Miss Powell saw was you passing the note. Yep. And then it must have been embarrassing too, her disciplining you in front of the whole class. Yeah, but the whole class saw what was going on, so it wasn't that bad. But I have all this extra homework to do. Still, it must be frustrating being punished for a note that wasn't yours. Hmm. So Jordan's mom just used the first two so far. What did you notice her doing? What were some of the things she said? Acknowledged his feelings. Yeah. Empathize yeah, that must empathy. empathize. Wow, you must have been really angry. Wow, that must have been, you know, overwhelming. Wow, that must have been embarrassing when she put you and called you out in front of everybody. And if you're wrong. Like she was wrong about the embarrassing. He goes, no, everybody knew what was going on. You don't have to be right when you reflect feelings. If you're wrong, hopefully they'll say, no, I wasn't angry. I was just, just disappointed. And you're like, oh, so you were disappointed. Okay. So how many of us would have did a bunch of communication blocks already? What? You were passing notes. You got extra homework. What? You're going to get an F. I mean, so many times we would just go right into problem solving or telling you. You got what you deserved. Oh, yeah. You did the crime. You pay the time, right? You do the time. 
And that's just communication blocks. That child is talking. And the more reflecting we do, the more they're going to tell you what's going on inside them. Once we use a communication block, conversation over. So now let's watch the, the next three steps here. It's not fair. I'm not even going to do the extra homework. Well, that's one thing you could do. Oops, hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll try that again. It's not fair. I'm not even going to do the extra homework. Well, that's one thing you could do. Now, what would happen if you don't do it? Well, Miss Powell would give me an F to average in with my grades. Ouch. That could really hurt, especially with all the hard work you put in this year. What else could you do? I could tell her what really happened. Yes, you could. And what would happen then? Well, all the kids would call me a tattletale, and Miss Powell would just say I had no business passing notes in the first place, and I should have ignored them. What do you think about that? I guess it was pretty dumb. I mean, I guess I knew that she didn't allow passing notes and all, but Mom, I didn't want the other kids to think I wasn't cool. I see. So you were afraid the other kids wouldn't like you if you followed Miss Powell's rules about not passing notes in class, so you let them get you in trouble because you wanted them to like you. Yeah, pretty dumb, right? Well, let's put it like this. It's only dumb if you keep doing it. And you look like a pretty bright kid. I think you've thought a lot about this, and I think it's something you can learn from. Yeah, okay. Jordan, how did that passing notes problem turn out? Did you do the extra homework? Yeah, I didn't think an F would be too great. And what about Kristen and Cody? Are they still asking you to pass notes in class? No way. I told them I didn't like what they did, and next time I'm just going to ignore them. All right. I like the way you stood up for yourself. You know, it's smart not to let people take advantage of you. Look at this. All right. Anybody, what did you like or dislike about that? What if you said, I, I ain't doing the, I don't, I'm not even gonna do the homework. What'd mom say? Mom said, well, that's one idea. What would happen, right? She looked for alternative. What would happen if you didn't do the homework? The kid's like, well, I'll probably get an F averaged in my, in my uh, grades. Wow, that would really stink after all the hard work you put in. What else can you do? I can tell the teacher what really happened, but what would happen then? So did mom solve Jordan's uh, problem? No, mom helped Jordan solve it. I mean, helped him understand how to work through to solve it. But yeah, Jordan solved it. Yeah, mom didn't give her not one bit of advice, not one communication block. All she did was listen, identify, empathize, and let's say you have a teenager and he says, you know what, I feel, I'm going to drop out of school. Our heads would pop off. What? Drop out of school? You better we say, wow. So I feel like dropping out of school. What would happen? What would happen if you dropped out of school? Just take them down that maze with open ended questions. So in that long thing about the, uh, the note passing, sometimes there's problems that we just need to address. Right there, um, all we need to do is identify the problem. When you identify the problem factually, objectively, I feel because, and Teresa talked about that in her um, you know, Tricks to Discipline, then we brainstorm for ideas. When you ask a child for ideas and they say something stupid, we just say, well, that's one idea, what else you got? Because if we ask them for an idea, like, um, what way can you make sure you come home on time for curfew? He says, well, just don't give me a curfew. We don't want to say, what do you better? Don't be a smart aleck or something like that. We want to say, well, that's one idea. What else? And we get a list of brainstormed ideas. And then we need to discuss each idea. Let's see about the no curfew. You know, I feel um, uh, concerned if you didn't have a curfew because the freaks come out at night, right? So. And there's rules and laws out there. So uh, what about if we did the, and whatever other things that he come up with. Now, if he's just coming up with negative um, 
ones we can come up with ideas also. What do you say if you come home late, you don't go out for the weekend, the next weekend, something like that. And then we choose the idea after we brainstorm because now we're getting that child involved in the solution. We're gonna choose that idea. Then we're gonna use it for um, a set amount of time. Well, let's try that for this month to see how it works out. So what is your understanding if you come home late? If I come home late, I won't go out the following weekend. Say, all right, have a good time. So now if that kid comes home late, I don't have to lecture. I don't have to punish. I don't have to do anything. All I have to say is, I see you chose not to go out next weekend. And I can just walk away. Now, what is that kid thinking? He's still upset at you, but. It's, it's his responsibility. He's blaming himself for the mistake. Yeah, he could still be angry at you, but he was involved. It might have been his idea in the first place. You didn't communication block him, lecture to him. You just say, I see you chose. Now he's sitting with that own feeling to say, oh, darn, it's all right. Now, next weekend, he can break that. But every strategy is only as good as the relationship it's built on. Now, there's just a couple more slides here that um, uh, I'm just going to skip. It's just the, the communication stuff in the summary. But now with that um, sibling rivalry thing, all we need to do is maybe go through this exploring alternatives. Give them that I statement, you know, whatever it is. You know, lately when I remember one of the um, presentations we did about the sass or the attitude, remember ignore that, that huffing and puffing while they're taking out the garbage, remember that one? And after that's all done, you can say, you know, I've noticed when I ask you to uh, do some things that you have a lot of um, attitude, what's going on? And get that conversation going. Brainstorm ideas. So when I ask, when you forget about a chore and I ask you to do it, you know, what are some ways that um, you could adjust that frustration so I don't have to get angry when I see it? Well, you know, and then, and then we talk about the behavior. We explore alternatives. We listen. All right, folks. What are some things about this that made sense? What are some of the things that you can relate to or some of the things that you might not relate to? The biggest thing for me was the empathy piece, you know, I I was reading this book a while back and, it's, and, and, it, and it talked about emotions and empathy. Uh, we're not hardwired to be empathetic. It has to be taught, you know, mm -hmm. and this is, and this is the, the modeling behavior that uh, I think that accomplishes that. You know, it's not like love, anger, you know, yeah. you know this is, those things are hardwired in, but empathy, you know, kids have to have experience with it. A kid parent has to model it and uh, to, to make it happen, because it's, it's important. I mean, the lack of empathy is what we see going on in, in the adult world, in my opinion, every day now. Yeah, absolutely. Remember, empathy is uh, in your prefrontal cortex. That's not developed until they're 25, 26, 27 right. years old. Right. Yeah, so for us to emp uh, model empathy, by these active communication, by me listening, by me not giving communication blocks, by me, me not giving those setup questions, not treating them as objects, that's all respect and that's all uh, empathizing with what they're going through. Right. And you use a version of that in, in classrooms. I remember, you know, I used to give my students input on the syllabus. I mean, you know, not nuclear options, but, you know, it's just, they just got to feel like they're a part of it. You know, yeah. yeah, not whether or not they'd be tested or not, not that kind of stuff, but you know, <laughs> just the, just the, the, the support structure and things that, you know, you can afford to be flexible about. Absolutely. You really appreciated the, uh, we've all heard it before. They don't care what you know until they know that you care. Oh yeah. Yeah, I love that, uh, that quote. Yeah. You can treat your classrooms just like a, a family. When there is a 
problem in the classroom, we're going to bring it out. We're going to explore alternatives. We're going to say how that behavior is affecting the whole class. Hey, class, when this goes on, you know, what can we do about it? What are some solutions? And get them all involved in whatever behavior is affecting the, the class. What can we do to have a happier experience? Mm-hmm. And get them involved in creating their own ideas. All right, for the sibling rivalry one, I don't know who shared that, but was anything in this presentation that you could kind of incorporate into what you were expressing in the beginning of the presentation? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, and definitely, I think the more I was listening also, the the worse I felt, but at the same time, the better I feel because I do think a lot of it is... um, due to attention. So I was just, I feel kind of dumb for getting sucked into that, but I feel good about uh, having it called to my attention, I guess, because I I think deep down, I probably knew that, but now Mm -hmm. I can really be more proactive about working on that. Yeah. So many times, you know, it's, we blame it all on the parents, right? Uh, When we grow up, you know, whatever our faults are, that's because my parents, because we all do the best that we can with the tools we know. And sometimes we don't reach our expectations. And then we're like, where did this kid come from? Why is this kid A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z? Well, it's you're accountable for some of that behavior. Sure, they have accountability for what they do, but sometimes the way we, re- the way we respond to this behavior is actually contributing or conditioning more of the same behavior as in power struggles and revenge struggles and attention seeking behavior and stuff. So we really got to do a self-assessment to say, is what I'm doing working? And if it's working, if it's working, then is is there going to be a healthy outcome? Because what works doesn't mean it's the most effective thing. Spanking works to stop behavior, but spanking could create some serious uh, behavior later on when they start becoming adolescents. I'm sorry, I cut somebody off. Go ahead. Susan or Denise? No, I was, I'm, I don't have anything to say right now. All right, Denise, go ahead. I was just going to talk about, I was just going to say, because you were talking about the um, discipline, is it good good behavior, bad behavior if they don't get caught? Yeah. Um, I I read something about uh, where they said something that said, um, children who are nice to their siblings and are rewarded for it will be mean to them when nobody's looking because they're not mm. going to get rewarded for it. Mm. So, um, which is funny because I have a niece and a nephew who are five and three and she is nice to him unless somebody is looking. Wow. <laughs> Learn how to play the game. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, she learned young. Yes. But I just thought it was funny. That was an interesting thought yeah. I had. And after we come back from break, uh, there's a few more topics. And one of the topics is building self-esteem. And one of them has that, that, that reward and punishment thing about our self-esteem. Uh, my nephew's like, his grades are going down. His mom's like, pick your grades up. And she, he was like, well, what do I get? And mom says, um, I'll get you iPod touch. This is when the iPod touches first came out. He says, if you pick your grades up, I'll get you an iPod touch. And he's like, well, I got to know, are you going to get it for me or not? Because why should I pick my grades up if you're not going to get it for me? And it's that whole reward and punishment kind of thing. That if you base, like get, giving your children a couple dollars for each A, all right, they might get straight A's to get the money, but their, their value is focused on the wrong thing. Their value is on the reward, let alone the value of learning and the value of getting, um, you know, attentive schooling and grades. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, we're at eight minutes after this time. Well, I appreciate your, uh, your comments. And I did go through that kind of swiftly. I really wanted to save time for more of the um, feedback and, and comments, because I like your perspective on it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. All right, you guys have a nice break. All right, guys, thanks for joining. 
We will see you all on Thursday. Thank everyone you. Everyone have a great day. You too, everyone. Take care.